Ellsworth from the CFA. Talk about new tools for laboratory cosmology. New tools, new tools from the lab for cosmology. The title changed slightly because it's not really tools that are being used in the lab or will be. Hopefully this works. It's so I'm going to talk about two things today, two topics, once I get this thing in my belt. One is a recap, a brief recap, of some of the things you heard from Shimon uh, this morning with a slightly different perspective. Um, maybe for some of you who weren't here, it'll be the first time, and we can talk about that afterwards if you want. So go through it quickly again, just hit the high points. And then spend most of my time on this topic, advances in precision astrophysical spectroscopy, which my group and collaborators have been realizing for uh, about, or working on for about a decade using laser frequency combs uh, for exoplanet science, directed exoplanet science. And that's mostly what I'm going to tell you about. And then I'm going to ask some questions um, about whether this technology could be redeployed to cosmological and fundamental physics questions. So really, I'm quite interested in people's ideas. And I've been giving a few talks like this over the last year or two to people because it's, I think the technology is becoming successful for exoplanet science, which is awesome, but we'd like to figure out ways to use it for fundamental physics and cosmology as well. And maybe some of these very, very speculative and ignorant statements that I'm putting here about things that might be uh, able to be claimed, you all could help me make a reality. So now the GW detection uh, with space-based atomic clocks. You heard, so many of you heard Shimon this morning, we have a paper that's a proposal paper, a somewhat serious, hopefully, initial proposal paper worked out uh, a particular scenario for space-based optical lattice optomic clocks. Shimon and Igor Pekovsky, who's an ITAMP postdoc, have really done the majority of the work. Igor can't be here, uh, but have really done an excellent job in, in, in fleshing out what was initially a very simplistic idea that some of the PIs came up with. Nick Langelier from my group helped also, and you'll hear about Nick later on in terms of the exoplanet science. And Shimon mentioned this, but I want to emphasize this too. We wouldn't have been working on this if it hadn't been for Avi Loeb. You heard Avi's name or saw his name mentioned in the previous talk by Anastasia, and I'm going to mention him a couple more times when it's time to talk about the, uh, the use of these astrochrome technology and maybe use it for cosmology. Avi's professor of astronomy here at Harvard and at the CFA, and he's a guy who comes up with lots of different ideas, and uh, it, some of them can be quite, uh, he's, he's very outgoing, and so they can have impact on a lot of different fields. And in particular, he and Danny Maaz from, uh, uh, from Israel had this idea and talk, contacted me, one thing led to another, and our idea grew out of that. It's the, in the end, the techniques that we're talking about using in detail are very different from what they were proposing here, but I want to give Avi and Danny um, credit for inspiring us, and as well, of course, the anemoneferometric ideas from Mark Kasevich, Jason Hogan, and others have been very influential, and they've also been very helpful to us learning, getting up the learning curve and thinking about these kinds of concepts. So the basic idea, um, as you heard of this morning, is to use two satellites, possibly more, orbiting the sun on some large length scales, maybe like 50 million kilometers, and with high performance atomic clocks on board, as well as a shared ultra-stable laser, really two lasers, but locked to each other and locked over time scales, which are short compared to the time scale for the gravitational waves to pass. So they can essentially uh, uh, track uh, and the Doppler shifts that, that, the lights, that the light will have will track the gravitational wave and distortion of the metric as a gravitational wave potentially passes and is to be detected. The clocks perform repeated measurements of the laser frequency. So in some ways, you can think of the clock as the local oscillator and the the atoms in the lattices is the probes of that local oscillator. If you have a gravitational wave passing in this direction, perhaps plus polarized, it will lead to this periodic distortion of the metric and hence a differential Doppler shift of the light, which would be sensed by the clocks. So that's a concept very similar to what's been done uh, before with Doppler tracking, as Shimon described this morning. Um, however, we came up with a particular scenario which we think has promise for operating in space with beyond state-of-the-art clocks. And I think the most exciting thing uh, that uh, uh, we've come up with is this ability to bridge the frequency range between the millihertz to the, to the hertz range by using dynamic decoupling techniques. And the flexibility that, that builds you with the internal states of atoms to be able to tune the frequency that you're sensitive to.
So, of course, one can have more than two satellites. If you do that, you can do a better job of detecting different polarizations of the gravitational waves as well as source -like localization, assuming everything works. So, again, as Shimon explained in detail, and I'll just mention briefly, inside each of the satellites, there's a strontium, strontium atoms are in an optical lattice, which itself referenced to a free mass. Uh, in an inertial, in inertial frame, it's very similar to what LISA is proposed to use. So um, that's different from the atom interferometric techniques. There are a lot of similarities between the two in many ways, and I think they both have a, a lot of merit and should be studied, but this is one technical difference that's, that's important. Um, the baseline we're talking about, again, is this kind of approximately 5 times 10 to the 10 meters. It doesn't have to be exactly that, but that seemed to, to give us the kind of millihertz uh, sensitivity out to about a millihertz or a few millihertz. The numbers that we used particularly in our proposal were about uh, 10 million strontium atoms. That's about a thousand fold more than has been achieved in uh, ground-based systems today, but talking to June, he believes that, that there's no real technical limitations other than just some hard work in a, in a few years to get to that point. Am I, am I correct, Shimon? Okay, so micro-Kelvin temperatures. The atom interferometric infer proposals, I believe, tend to need yeah, nano Kelvin temperatures, uh, and so I think there's there's a difference there, or maybe even colder. Clock line widths on the order of a millihertz. The uh, uh, the lattice, as I mentioned, reference to this free mass or the free masses in each satellite. Uh, the laser, this ultra stable laser, about 30 millihertz line width was assumed. That's state of the art today. And if you work it out, the necessary number of photons which need to be detected at each satellite. Uh, to not be photon shot noise limited, require you to emit powers that are on the approximately 50 milliwatts, so not um, ridiculously large powers. So um, the utility of this device, if you look at the predicted sensitivity of something like a LISA detector, strain sensitivity is a function of frequency, and jumping right to it, Shimon went through the different schemes, but with the, what we believe the optimal scheme, which is the, using the dynamic decoupling uh, techniques, allow you to have a tunable very narrow band detector. So again, like a spectrum analyzer or a lock-in amplifier, you can pick to op pick, you can choose to operate at any particular frequency with very very similar sensitivity. It's not a broadband detector, and whereas LISA is, and so you but you can maintain that sensitivity. It's something like this if all the assumptions we were, I was listing out on the previous page, as well as some others about optimizing correlated spectroscopy measurements and others are realized, you can maintain that sensitivity out to 10 hertz or beyond, mapping onto the capabilities of, of ground-based detectors. So broad and narrow band detectors, of course, in many areas of science have both have utility, and in astronomy in particular, in astrophysics, there are wide field imaging systems where you want to do whole sky surveys and very narrow, uh, ang very high angular sensitive imaging activity uh, uh, experiments that are done with different telescopes for different purposes. As I'll get into in my, the majority of my talk, high resolution uh, astrophysical spectroscopy, meaning high spectral resolution, is very important for some applications, but for others you don't want that. You want low resolution because you're having a large dynamic range, let's say, of Doppler shifts as you're tracking objects and you actually want an uh, optimal low resolution uh, and you're looking to, to find things and later zoom in. Well, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about uh, in, in this sort of work here. Maybe there will be detections made with LISA initially with a broadband detector, and then one would choose to track those slowly evolving signals over long periods of time with a narrowband detector, screening out signals that you're not interested in uh, that are coming from other sources. So they could be complementary, and I think currently that is the technologies could, and we're not proposing these clock-based schemes as, an all, as a replacement to LISA in any way. If all worked out and our initial ideas turn out not, not to be bad, then it would probably be a complementary technology where you'd have broadband detectors and narrowband detectors. So moving forward, the utility of the scheme, and this, and this is similar to, to Shimon's plot he had in his talk too, would be bridging in this frequency regime from about 10 millihertz up to tens of hertz with good sensitivity, uh, this sensitivity gap between LISA and ground-based detectors like LIGO. There are a variety of phenomena that people have predicted should be uh, Ongoing in that frequency gap, such as the early stages of these black hole binaries as they inspiral, you know, the ones that uh, were detected with LIGO so far, they just saw the last little bit of their existence. They were spiraling in with detectable signals if one had had this kind of a detector over hours and days and weeks and months. And there are probably other sources to be 
examined too. So I think there's going to be a lot of utility for such a detector if one has it. Uh, uh, I again want to emphasize that we'd expect similar sort of performance from these atom interferometric techniques. Exactly which would be better is to be determined with, it will probably depend upon uh, a series of technical details. I think um, Mark's not here, but I think he'd probably agree with that too. So, and both should be pursued. And, you know, having atomic clocks and other sort of precision sensors in space in some sort of arrays is going to be good for other science, obviously. Atoms have mass and charge and spin and other. Uh, quantum numbers associated with them that could be very relevant for searching for other types of physics and not as in addition to doing gravitational wave detection. Okay, so now for something completely different, or not com almost completely different, I'll switch to the second half of my talk in which I'm going to talk about precision astrophysical spectroscopy and mostly tell you about the work we've been doing in exoplanets, its motivation and developing the technology, and then, then towards the end, ask these questions of, okay, so what? What, this, what could this technology be potentially useful for, for uh, your interests and mine as well? So precision astrophysical spectroscopy is an enabling technology. It's used in cosmology already, but particularly for exoplanet science these days. Um, the time-varying Doppler shifts that are induced by exoplanets is indicated in this, in this cartoon. Uh, are one of the main ways that exoplanets are detected and also characterized. So, as you might have heard many times in this cartoon, one has a star. If there's a planet going around it, they, of course, orbit their uh, the center of mass, and this can induce a periodic Doppler shift back and forth uh, on the line of sight if it happens to be oscillating in that direction towards the telescope, induce, inducing a periodic redshift and blue shift. Similarly, in cosmology, there are phenomena in which there can be uh, measurements in which you're looking for very small spectral changes uh, that are relevant to fundamental physics, such as the expansion of the universe and its deceleration through most of its his history and, and its acceleration recently. So towards the end of the talk, I'll talk about this cartoon here, the, which is relevant to the so-called Sandage Loeb test. There's obvious Loeb, Avi Loeb's name again, and the so-called Lyman Alpha Forest measurements. Okay, and this is just to say help wanted in bridging ideas between experiment and theory, please. Um, okay, most of you probably aren't, don't work in exoplanets, but you probably read the newspaper or online or something like this, and if you pay attention, you might notice that it seems like they found the Earth, they, they found the first Earth-like planet, uh, and you read about that, and then a few months later you read about it again, like they've done it again, and then they seem to have done it again, and then they've done it again, and uh, I think what's going on in that community is they've made dramatic improvements and dramatic discoveries improvements in their technology and wonderful discoveries, but they really haven't discovered true Earth analog planets around true sun-like stars because they haven't had the technical capability to do it. But they have discovered other very interesting planets which are in some ways Earth-like. They've got the right temperature, they've got the right size, they've got this, they've got that, but they don't have all the characteristics of, an, of something very close to an Earth around something very close to a sun. Now, one doesn't just care about that. It's very interesting to discover what's out there. But there is a bias, a human bias, to dis towards discovering true Earth analogs around true Sun analogs, particularly if you're interested in origins, origins of life, etc. So beware the announcements that are made and that you read about. Hopefully the you know, exoplanet astronomers are here. They don't like this to get out, that this kind of boy crying wolf thing is going on. They're doing a lot of really awesome work, but then they are pitching it to the, the larger communities if they're over and over again discovering the first Earth-like planet hasn't been done. And the reason is this, what I said before, there is not the technical capability. What you really need to do in, and, and by the way, let me note that direct detection of planets, small planets, is not possible, meaning direct imaging or spectroscopy, and that's because planets are very small, they reflect some light, that, it, that some degree of light from the star, and if that planet was pulled away very far from the star, it would be detectable, but being very close to the star in terms of its angular distance, angular separation, you end up having the essentially the airy rings, the refractive effects of the very, very bright stars swamping the light that comes from the planet. Except in some very extreme cases of very large planets, many times the size of Jupiter, very far from their sun. There are a few examples of those being able to be imaged. You know, let's say post, well beyond Pluto's orbit, giant super Jupiters. There's a few cases. Yes? Uh, so On the previous slide, you had this uh, yellowish Earth-like planet. So I didn't, I didn't, ha I, I, as you notice, I didn't have that. That's, uh, that's taken from some NASA website. So in general, I think no. Most of these things, when you see these beautiful pictures, are beautiful pictures. 
there's small amounts of information that they have about some of the planets I want to try to get. And then there's models. And theorists like you talk to artists, and then there are uh, pictures. Is that how it goes? No? No, not theorists <laughs> like you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, question, like the, um, those interferometers, like on uh, Mount Wilson, like they can image a star now, right? They can really see the... the Be, with a few pixels in a few cases. I thought, I thought they could really see that it was like... Old, they were right, so a few pixels, I forget, how, I forget whether a few pixels is 4 or 40, but there's like a few pixels across certain nearby, nearby stars, and they have been able to see things which are, you know, is it oblate? Yeah. This sort of thing, prolate, and see dimmer regions that might be related to sunspots. But and I, the, the technical improvements are fantastic. I just want to try to set the stage because sometimes when I give these talks, people go, "Haven't they already discovered these planets?" And uh, the answer is they've discovered many things, but not all the way there. Which, and I've been in the field for a while trying to help them get to the that community get to the point of being able to actually detect Earth-like planets. All right. So these, these, the two techniques that you'd really like to use in any given discovery to be able to sure that, uh, be sure it's a discovery, and they're indirect techniques, both of them, meaning you're not seeing the light directly from the planet. One is the radial velocity technique, where the planet goes around the star, periodic oscillation of the star's center of mass relative to, to you, and you detect this periodic redshift and blue shift. Here's actual data from one, from one example. The other is the transit method. Transit method with the planet passing in front of the star, blocking a little bit of the light, and then doing it again periodically, periodically when the planet passes in front. They give complementary information, which together are often used or usually used to say we've discovered a planet. This method gives plant, and I'm speaking very loosely here, there's more detail to it, so just let me speak qualitatively. This gives information on the planet mass, as well, of course, its orbital period. And if, typically for the types of stars that they can see from the spectrum, they can determine with reasonable uncertainty the star mass. So therefore, from Kepler's laws, they will know the, uh, they'll know the, the, uh, and the orbital period. You'll know things like the, the planet mass and also the, the distance of the, the planet away from the star. This technique gives the planet diameter or volume. Because again, for, given from the spectrum, you tend to know in the laws of physics and how nuclear fusion works, they know things within about 10% of star mass and also its diameter. Okay, and then you get a little bit of a shadowing effect. Together, you get mass density when you know both of them. And you have, if you see that they're synchronized appropriately, that is the radial velocity shift and the transit method, you can see two techniques both telling you that there is an object passing in front of the star in just the same way. And you can figure out things like the, um, the mass density, which is very important to know whether it's a gas planet, a rocky uh, metal planet, a mostly water ice planet, etc. That latter type is, turns out to be very common. And you need to do this to be able to tell these differences between different types of planets, which they care to know. And then from that, generate these yellow or red or gray colored cartoons. This is out of date data. It's five years old. I'm sorry, I've got to get a better plot. And there are many more red dots that should be on this plot in this same region here than they're currently listed. I need a better plot. But what this shows you is the mass of discovered planets and Jupiter masses as a function of the distance away of that planet from its star, discovered at least initially with the, the radial velocity technique or the transit technique, and then usually they follow up with the other one. So in the last few years, there have been a lot more transit discoveries, and they tend to be in here. The thing I want to point out to you, though, is Earth, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, etc., so-called habitable zone where people estimate you might have life, there aren't any planets in here, and there certainly aren't any right in here. There are a few that have come down uh, in the last few years, some red ones that are maybe around in here. So getting, or excuse me, around in here, similar mass to the Earth, but closer in. They haven't yet got any in this zone, and that's what I mean when I tell you that they have not yet found an Earth-like planet around the sun-like star. And the reason is a series of issues that are related to discovering these small planets, because compared to the the planets I'm showing you, most of them are much more massive or much closer in, so they have a bigger effect on their star. Right? If you really want to get something that's not very massive and far away from its star, there are a variety of technical challenges, and three that I'm going to emphasize after I ask, answer uh, Derek's question. So just to get the story straight, so when I tell this to you, I don't get it wrong, they, they, it's true that they've discovered planets in the habitable zone for other types of stars, just not sunlight stars. Is that correct? They've discovered some... 
Yes, very dim stars. And so if you're in the habitable zone around a dim red dwarf, you have to be much closer, otherwise it's too cold. And then you have a very short year, and you're, then the, the planet might be similar to the size of the Earth or a little bit larger, and it's usually thought to be tidally locked, although that's a model-dependent um, conclusion, and thought to have, and often these red dwarfs, in addition to being dim, so you have to be closer to be warm enough, also are much more, tend to be very volatile. They have two to three order of magnitude increases, short-term increases in the intensity of the energy that they put out, both charged particles and, and, uh, and, and uh, photons, due to phenomena that I don't remember what the mechanism is. But there, there are these periodic <clears throat> spikes and things like this. No, it, they're, they're physical phenomena. They're real, too. But they're very different from what we're talking about in terms of Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. Right. And then it, not, they haven't found things around higher mass stars further away. So it's all been... Yeah, the number of lo large mass stars that you, like blue giants and things like this, are very few. Those are very rare stars. Plus, they also tend to have, have huge amounts of problem. Challenge number three, which I'm going to get to here, is, is issues with the stars. They tend to be very volatile, very unstable. So it's hard to make measurements up from them because either their intensity is varying a lot, so you don't see the effect of the transit photometry, or their spectral lines are all over the are going crazy, and so it's hard to measure things with them. So there are very relatively few stars like that, and, and they're typically not good candidates to to search for planets in the, for those technical reasons. Okay, so <clears throat> for the for the radial velocity technique, the challenge number one is that the effects are small. Right, you've got a as you go to an Earth mass planet or smaller around a sun-like star at a one AU that kind of distance. It turns out that the magnitudes of the frequency shifts, the Doppler shifts, are small, as I'm going to describe to you. So, if you're thinking about, you have your star, your sun-like star, it's emitting light. You have your source. It has to pass through intervening matter. You have to deal with the fact that the Earth is rotating. Your telescope's there, so there's barycentric corrections you have to make because there's a lot of velocity associated with being on the surface of the Earth. You have issues with your telescope. Is it large enough? Does it work well? Does it shake around? Does it have issues? You have to have a high-performance spectrograph, which I'll tell you a little bit about. You have to have, somehow calibrate that spectrograph so that you know what the pixels mean in terms of wavelength and that things aren't drifting around. Because these small uh, Doppler shifts that you're looking for, if it's a true Earth-like planet around a sun-like star, how long does that take the Earth to go around the sun? Do you know, Derek? How long does it take? I bet you do. Good, good. You're getting an A. So that's, and you want to, so you want to measure some periodic thing that's painfully slow at that kind of a period. You know, it, it, it's annoying and and slow, but it is what it is, and so you have to stabilize the system too. Then there's issues with data reduction. The shifts are small, so not by laboratory standards. If it turns out that um, here's Doppler shifts in terms of their frequency, in terms of the and mapping it onto what it means in terms of uh, velocity changes, okay? So it turns that, uh, out that, that the Earth around the sun makes about a nine centimeter per second, we'll call it 10 centimeter per second uh, velocity change. So in the center of the mass of motion of the sun. So the sun is moving forward like this, and six months later it's moving forward like this, and it has this kind of, uh, and the amplitude of that sinusoidal oscillation approximately is nine centimeters per second, plus or minus, okay? In play. So all these things, I'm making it simple here. Do they worry about things that are airplane? Yes, but I'm going to keep the story simple and just talk about in-plane motion, all right, to keep the story simple. So that's not 100 kilohertz, it turns out. That's a bit, what are you talking about? That's a monster shift. We see that in the lab all the time, you're, right? That's not a small shift, except if you think about the spectral lines, and this is real data in terms of, from the sun, false colored. So the color is there to amuse you. But there's actually real data, and every dark patch you see here is a real absorption line in the outer photosphere of the sun. It's iron, it's calcium, it's, it's this, it's that. On the, sometimes it's neutral, sometimes it's singly, doubly ionized, etc. Each one of these lines in the spectrum from the sun is some tens of gigahertz wide. All right, and if you look at, um, uh, 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 so you're talking about measuring something that's tens of gigahertz wide, and you'd like to see a hundred kilohertz shift on the time period of a year. You know, part in ten to five, part in ten to six shift. Maybe you could do it in the lab, stabilize things. You know, da da da. But this is a star; it's not stabilized. You can't control it. And in most cases, even with big telescopes, the number of photons that are associated with some spectral line is very small. 
So you're often shot noise limited, even if somehow everything was very stable and there weren't systematic effects. So the solutions that the that community came up with a long time ago is to um, search for a common mode shift, a periodic Doppler shift of all the lines together, or most of the lines, across hundreds of nanometers in the spectrum. To basically average, they're looking for the entire spectrum to go blue and red and blue and red. Individual lines might be doing individual things associated with pressure broadening or other phenomena in the star, but they're hoping that the one thing that would cause a periodic, or at least one thing that would cause a periodic redshift and blue shift for all lines, taking advantage of all photons across hundreds of nanometers of the spectrum, is things something like a planet going around it. So um, that's why what happens with these spectrographs that are chosen, they're chosen to be broadband, but also have as, that meaning operating over hundreds of nanometers, but also operate with as high a spectral resolution as you one can actually practically make. And that is that, uh, and so that typically is something like four gigahertz spectral resolution. So you're going to end up looking for a 100, 100 kilohertz shift, where the spectral resolution of your spectrograph is about four gigahertz, which means you have to average again over many pixels, many lines, in, in to be able to see such a thing. So if you work it out, you think, and you put the typical numbers for how many photons you get in a typical astronomical observation from a star that's not too far away, some tens to hundreds of light years away, that's a sun-like star in an hour with a big four or five meter telescope and you have some 10 gigahertz wine line and you can determine you can determine the, the line center shifts of a given line to about 30 megahertz given those numbers and you average 100,000 or so of these spectral lines you might be able to see a shift of about 10 centimeters per second so that's the kind of uh, and then you do 100 of them or so to average down to one centimeter per second so you can see these nine these 10 centimeters per second shifts out of the noise uh, and uh, then you do that over and over again as the days and weeks and months and years roll by and, and hope you see multiple and try to see multiple periods to be able to see this effect. So that's how they have gotten to solve problem of one of small shifts is by big telescopes, broad spectral coverage uh, to get all the photons you can and average in this sort of way. Challenge two, even if you could do that and they do do that, is the wavelength calibration. I hinted at this before. Spectrograph is a wonderful device multiple layers of, uh, of, of environmental control. Uh, there are two of, two of these state-of-the-art spectrographs that are, have been built, both by the same group in Geneva. One is in the, the southern hemisphere called HARPS South, and one is in the northern hemisphere called HARPS North, and HARPS is an acronym I won't bore you with. They're wonderful devices, and they're very stable passively, but they have some remnant level of drift. And you'd like to actually know this pixel to wavelength uh, uh, you'd, you'd like to know what the pixel to wavelength conversion is. So you want to stabilize and know that. So you need some sort of calibrator. And what am I showing here? I'm showing you a spectrum of what had heretofore, before our work, been the state-of-the-art calibrator that was typically used, which was emission lamps, a thorium argon emission lamp, thorium argon. Wonderful device, not locked to atomic clocks. The, the spectral lines are not regular. There's many of them. Sometimes they're blended. The devices age slowly over time. They have special lamps that they only use once in a while, like fine bottles of wine and things like this. And so they've been able to, get, with such a technology, and they really have done a wonderful job. Let me see, where is it there? Been able to get down to about one meter per second sensitivity with these thorium argon lamps. There's also absorption cells that are sometimes used too. So you can get that about one meter per second precision stability. So what we did was develop a different technology using laser frequency combs, optimized for operation at, at telescopes. And now you have something that can provide the line spacing that you want over 100 plus nanometers of coverage, all locked to atomic clocks. So that, okay, I'm gonna not bore you with the cartoon. Let's go through this quickly. So yes, that's a cartoon. For some talks, I go through the cartoon. Let's not do that. So to save time. So this, um, this astrocomb system, as I'm going to tell you, works well. And this really solves the, the wavelength calibration challenge. You can chew, and there's the, the traits that I told you about. I had this idea to do this maybe close to 15 years ago. But we didn't really start working on it until 2007. We got it working in the lab and had this paper in Nature here in 2008. So that's eight years ago. But taking something that worked well in the lab and getting it to work well enough on a mountaintop long term as a kind of facility took a number of years. So it's a Thai sapphire based comb. There's a German group and company that actually uses fiber based combs. We upconvert from the near infrared uh, using tapered photonic crystal fiber. 
That's great, but the line spacing of these tiny sapphire combs are about one gigahertz. That's the rep rate is about one nanosecond in, inside the, or the, rep, the circulation time of the cavity is around one nanosecond, making the approximately 15 gigahertz line spacing that you actually need for these spectrographs, given what their actual resolution is, and given the trade-offs they face, you have, we had to filter, there's all those lines, we have to filter it out so we only get, let's say, every 15th line. And you can't have, you can't just do a mediocre job of filtering. We have to get more than 35 dB of suppression because if you have a line and there's a slight asymmetry down 20 dB down or something, and one line here is one suppressed neighboring line is a little higher than this one here, you can get essentially line pulling and it can corrupt your calibration and uh, really give you, give you errors. So we do this with two uh, Fabry Perot cavities in, in succession that are brought with these wonderful um, dielectric mirrors, chirp mirrors that are multi-layer mirrors that can operate over broadband and be dispersion compensated and this sort of thing. And it now works. So let me skip ahead. But two years ago we had the system installed at the in the Canary Islands at the TNG telescope. That's the National Telescope of the Italians. It's where this Harps North spectrograph is located. Nice pictures. Come on. There we go. That's the telescope. That's inside. Well, that's the telescope building. There's the telescope itself. The telescope was, of course, up high. The astrocomb is located in its own room here. And Harps North, the spectrographers below, they're all fiber fed and connected to each other. So it sits on an optical table, kind of looks like it could be one of your labs, right? But it's in this dedicated room there at the TNG telescope. And it is not fully automated. It will run typically for a few days without tending. Uh, and so we typically operate it for, let's say, three week periods when there's a human there, one of us there to do the thing. And then in between, uh, when nobody's there, it, we just typically don't run it. And they use the thorium argon lamps and then bridge when we come back again. And in fact, David Phillips works with me, is there right now, flew out a couple days ago, and he's busy taking, doing observations and, and operating the astrocomb and our small solar telescope that we're using to study the sun as well. So it's working well. We've achieved now with this calibration about one centimeter per second short-term calibration of the Harps North spectrograph, and we can monitor and correct for long-term instrument drift with remnant drifts of about one centimeter per second per day, which is well below the, uh, the thing, what you need to detect the Earth around the sun. So great, but now comes the final challenge, if you will, challenge number three, which is the community calls stellar jitter. You have your instrumentation working well. You've got enough photons. You're not going to be shot in limited. These astrocombs are calibrating things. It's, everything's nice and stable. But the stars themselves are not just little point sources of light being pulled around by planets who are uh, giving you spectral Doppler shifts for your exoplanet science. They do that, but they also are complicated large objects. They have oscillatory modes, many of them. They will have uh, sunspots, they'll have plages, they'll have magnetic fields, and all sorts of phenomena that can corrupt the spectrum and seem like be systematic errors that can be real effects that look like uh, basically pump power into the Doppler shift spectroscopy that you try to do to, to search for planets. So what we're doing to try to study this and correct for this problem is uh, looking at the sun directly, but now with a small solar telescope where we throw away a lot of the information you get about the sun, and we look at it at the sun as if it was a point-like star. And we do this with a small telescope we built. is now attached to the side of the TNG building that I showed you, and we do these observations during the day. We feed the light to the Harps North spectrograph, calibrated by the astrocomb, and we're trying to, to study the sun and look at its, its um, basically, its spectrum as a function of time, and see ultimately can we pull out the uh, RV signature of Venus. We're choosing Venus because we get away from common mode effects of the Earth, and it turns out that the RV amp effect of Venus on the Sun is almost exactly the same as the Earth. Slightly less massive, a little bit closer. It turns out it's about the same. Really what we're doing, the search for Venus is the uh, sexy sounding conclusion. What we're really doing is understanding the stellar jitter problem by uh, combining the information that we have uh, spectral information as a function of time or information that we get by from other instruments that are looking at the sun, taking images of it, knowing where the sunspots are, etc. And so we're developing models to try to correct the phenomena that we see with our small, so, so, the spectroscopy we're doing on the sun with a small solar telescope to try to develop models which are 
unique enough ideally in this inverse problem that if we throw away information about the details of, uh, of uh, what's going on in the sun that we get from the other telescopes, the models will ideally still correct properly as long as a star is sufficiently like the sun. For example, are there spectral features which, which change the depth of lines or the positions of lines when sunspots are in a certain location as opposed to when there's an oscillatory mode, etc. If you can find unique mapping between them and there's enough confidence that that's not just special to the sun, but any star that's close enough to the sun this model would work, then we could uh, succeed. We may also find that with great certainty this, this, uh, this kind of program is not going to work, that there is too many different phenomena which all can, including planets and other things, and sunspots, et cetera, which can map into the same spectral signatures that there's not a unique way to disentangle them. That would be unfortunate, but it would still be an advance because it would let us know that this sort of approach is not going to work even then because we, the, suns, the stars are too complicated. So we're deep into this project now, and we've piled up a bunch of data, and we still have a long way to go to get it done. And that's one of the things that Nick, is, his thesis project involves doing a lot of this work. Nick Langelier, who also worked on the, a little bit on the clock gravi gravitational wave uh, approach. So to conclude, we've got this technology sitting there, and others could replicate it. In fact, they are. Both the big telescopes through Harps North, Calibrate with the Astrocomb, as well as uh, the small solar telescopes. But just think forward with me a little bit and imagine that this calibration that we've achieved of ability to see spectral signature, spectral shifts which are equivalent to one centimeter per second changes in sources. Uh, imagine that we have sources where there's not, the, the systematics aren't a big problem uh, or can be figured out. And now, because you're, you're calibrating things with, and tying it to atomic clocks, you can have really an arbitrarily long baseline in which you can look for a change in velocity of one centimeter per second divided by an arbitrarily long baseline, which can give you, let's say in three years, sensitivity to accelerations that are like 10 to the minus 8 centimeters per second squared, very small accelerations. Are those accelerations interesting? Or are they just some arbitrary number? Well, if you plop down and do a little uh, back of the envelope calculation, if you look at what the change of the comic cosmic expansion rate is over time, it turns out to be about one centimeter per second per year. So that over about three years, you'd get, uh, uh, you know, you'd get, uh, excuse me, one centimeter per second per year. So an acceleration of about three times ten to the minus eight centimeters per second squared. So I'm going to tell you in a minute about the Sandage Loeb test, and uh, there's Avi Loeb's name again. And um, what this would provide, though, is a real-time measure of cosmological dynamics. That is, not just inferring cosmological dynamics, as humans have, have done to date, by looking at a bunch of objects at, as a function of redshift and developing models which explain that in terms of things changing, but actually watching things and seeing them actually change as you're watching them over, let's say, a few years of observation. That would be a direct measure of the Hubble constant as a function of z, not an inference of it. Everything we have today are inferences of cosmological dynamics. Pretty cool. It may also be able to determine the total matter content of the universe, meaning the not dark matter, the baryonic matter, and an independent mo uh, measure of dark energy. It's still technically very challenging, but it's with the ability to do this kind of high-performance spectroscopy uh, over arbitrarily long times, it's at least conceivable to start thinking about it. It still will need massive telescopes, like 30-meter telescopes, beyond what exists today, but are, people are talking about, to get enough photons to not, not be shot noise limited. Then there are other sorts of things. If you look at what, what's the rotation acceleration of galaxies, they vary by... I believe a couple orders of magnitude depending on the size of the galaxy, but something like 10 to the minus 8 centimeters per second squared is typical for the, the galactic rotation accelerations. So, you know, we also infer, look at galactic rotation curves and develop them based upon maps of what the Doppler shifts are, or the velocities are of a variety of stars as a function of radius, but could you actually observe objects over time, see the effect of their changing acceleration, figure it out, the change of velocities, and further acceleration, and from that make direct maps of dark matter, or, or maybe less steps to infer the, the presence of dark matter. This could, might be something that goes beyond the Gaia mission, which is flying now, which is doing astro astro astrometry uh, and parallax measurements on very large numbers of stars in our galaxy, as well as doing line of sight coarse radial velocity measurements, and we could be able to do things like that. And maybe there are other kind of high-Q phenomena like binary stars or hypervelocity stars, which don't have many other things perturbing them, in which you might be able to see as they move through or exposed to differing densities of dark matter or other things of interest or topological defects or something, you might be able to see a perturbation which shows up as a weak effective acceleration that you can measure 
with these sorts of techniques? Maybe. Notice all the question marks. These are kind of ideas I pulled, except for the Sandage Loeb test. That's a very nice idea developed by Sandage and Loeb. Except for that, these are th sort of things that pulled out of my ear. And I would like people's help on to either discard them or tell me there's some merit to them. So quickly, Sandage Loeb test. Uh, and this is uh, Anastasia in her talk was didn't quite talk about this, but, but some of the uh, range in Z from about two to six is where this is, this is relevant. Here's a cartoon. You have quasars. She mentioned them. That can be with Zs of, light, of two, four, five, six, et cetera. Their light passes to us as observers. They produce high intensity, uh, relatively broadband light, but, a, but as it comes out, it will pass through intervening high and low density regions, mostly of hydrogen gas. And therefore, you will get Lyman alpha absorption. But Lyman alpha absorption that's in the uh, reference frame of the cosmologically redshifted reference frame of each gas cloud on its way to us. So you do a column density of absorption. And these things are well known, many of them. And in fact, people see things like this. So this is wavelength and angstroms moving towards the blue and intensity. And you can have a particular quasar that's uh, been determined to be at a redshift of about 2.3, about 11 billion years ago. And it has many of these absorption figures. Each one is Lyman alpha being absorbed, as well as a few other lines, at varying densities of, of hydrogen along the way. So it's a, and you get this sort of fingerprint of that, that, uh, that particular quasar. And it's, this phenomenon is known as the Lyman alpha forest. To date, before the suggestions of Sandage and Loeb, it was thought of as just a static feature. You know, you're just seeing this thing. It doesn't change. It's just what it is. If you're at a less redshifted, there is less clouds between the emitting quasar and us, and so you get less features. The basic idea is to monitor a spectrum like this over time. And you would see, according to the standard model of, cosmo standard model of cosmology, slightly less redshift, uh, i.e. a blue shift in the spectrum, it's kind of the leading order. It's more complicated than that because it's a function of where the, the, the column density and where the hydrogen and glass clouds are. Some are going to be decelerated more than others. And in the very recent times, we believe deceleration just due to, just due to the breaking of the universe, due to the normal matter and photons throughout much of its history, turns over to acceleration. But basically, what you'd see is a small change in the spectrum that's due to uh, this deceleration of the expansion of the universe through most of its history. That's never been seen, but it should be there. The magnitude of the effect is so small that in Avi Loeb's paper in 1998, where he proposed this specific measurement, he's, he, and he didn't know we'd get to the ability to measure these sorts of things, he said it's worth thinking about, even though in his estimates it would take measurements of 100 years or more to make. Here it might take, with improved technology, if you have big enough telescopes, maybe just a few years. OK. so. People have done calculations of if you measure this change, effective change in velocities or red, these redshifts and change in velocity as a function of z, you can, uh, and then you did this for many of these quasars and different uh, with the Lyman alpha force in each case, you can map out families of curves which are given by the different matter content of the universe. And then the difference between these different curves here are different dark energy models. And in particular, this is a particular powerful test in this Z region of Z from about 2 to 5 or 2 to 6, which on a logarithmic plot looks like a small fraction of the history of the universe, but on a linear time plot would be the majority of the history of the universe, in which actually the majority of the deceleration of the expansion and then the transition to uh, acceleration, believed to be ex transition, occurred during this period. And you'd be most, sus most um, susceptible, these measurements would, to determining things like the matter content of the universe. OK, there have been people 10 years ago or so in Europe who thought about doing such a thing. This mission never got uh, funded, but they had basically the same goal, the primary goal, to test the cosmological model by measuring the predicted drift in the redshift of distance sources as a function of time. They need a very huge telescope and highly accurate and stable wavelength scale, i.e. these calibrators. That problem has been solved, basically, with these astrocombs, though we would still need much bigger telescopes than exist. Uh, the telescopes? 30 meters, as I mentioned before. They're on the drawing board, but they've been proposed. But what's happening, the, the Europeans have won their building, supposedly, and the Americans too. But as the prices go up, they've kind of been shrunk down from 30 to 20 meters or something like that. But yep, so I need to end. Oops.
Let me go back. So I'll end. There's the list of ideas. Uh, and I welcome comments. Help wanted. These are members of my group. And I've circled in red the folks. There's Nick Langelier, Alex Glenday, Chi Hao Lee, who both moved on, former grad student and postdoc, David Phillips, Quentin Neros, Tim Milburn, uh, and uh, Chris Doloff, an undergrad who worked a lot on the Astrocom project, and Nick also on the clock gravitational wave uh, project with Shimon and, and Igor. Thank you for your attention. It causes the star to move. Right. So, yeah. so would you also be sensitive to some like breathing mode in the sky? You're saying not due to the planet, so don't pay attention to the planet. Yes. Uh, so, yes, there are a variety of phenomena. So, I'll give you one example. The breathing modes is one, but one that's easy to understand. Just think about the rotation of the star. Okay. So, the star's rotating, so that means one edge is moving towards you and is more blue shifted. The other side here is going to be moving and red shifted. Imagine there's a, also a sunspot, which happens to be moving across and the sunspots are dimmer and tend to give off less light. While it's on that blue shifted side, just happens to be while you're observing it, that's essentially, essentially, let's call it half the light is blue shifted, half the light red shifted. It's like a, a, a line broadening. But now you remove some of the blue shifted light and so in addition to line broadening, there's a net red shift. And now this sunspot moves across and it kind of goes on that blue, blue shifts and things like this. So that's one cartoon example, but that many of them Many of them will, will leak into effects which will seem like they're these common mode redshift, blue shift f phenomena. So we want to understand those things much better so we can correct for them. And also you typically want to see a periodicity over multiple periods, ideally properly synchronized with the transit phenomena, or the transit uh, measurements, so that you see the dip in light and the periodicity of the Doppler shift all make sense and they're all essentially in the proper phase with each other. So that, that is all consistent when you see such things with a physical object that's blocking some of the light as well as has enough mass to pull on the star uh, in just the right way. But yes, oscillatory modes can too. It's a little, if they're highly symmetric, they tend not to. They will just tend to line broaden. But many of the modes uh, together with rotation and magnetic fields will have some asymmetry to them, radial asymmetry, and you'll get, uh, you'll get effective Doppler shifts. So then the question is, fine, there's an effective Doppler shift, but how is it periodically modulated? Fortunately, it turns out that the time scales of Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, i.e. on the order of a year, let's say several months to a couple years, that kind of period that seems to be the, where these sort of planets around sun-like stars are going to be located and the kind of periods of the planets uh, and their orbital periods, that time scale is relatively quiet for these sun-like stars, meaning that the other phenomena that are going on tend to be occurring at different time scales or different frequencies. So we're not smack dab in the middle of the, there's a, the, our sun has a five minute cycle, all right, that's associated with a particular high frequency oscillatory mode. And there are, you've probably most of you have heard of 11 year sun cycles and these sorts of things. There's a variety of different typical cycles, some of these seen in other stars so, too. Not that much going on at the kind of one year time scale. Not like there's nothing going on, but it's not a, a particularly noisy period for sun like stars. So that's in our favor. Gary? Oh, maybe as a, a naive follow up question. You mentioned um, in these uh, sol uh, star perturbations a plage. What's a plage? A plage is a, a region of, of higher intensity uh, where the sunspots are dark, sort of like the opposite of a sunspot. You know, they're both related to local magnetic field. Uh, in homogeneities, one of which leads to some cooling in the other one, and exactly the, the upwelling and lack of upwelling of the plasma as perceived from the outside seems to be in one case a cooling as opposed to a heating. Really what you're seeing is what level of, in the atmosphere you're seeing from the star. So it's a plagiarist. Um, for this uh, last thing, this uh, looking at the quasar uh, alpha, uh, alpha forest, yep. it seems that you might need the collection, collection area of a 30 millimeter telescope, but you just need the area. Like, if you could make your instrument cheaper, you don't need the, the you could do it with 100 3 meter telescopes, right? I, 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 yeah, I think that's probably true. Um, I think our, our astrocombs, ours, we're not going to make those bunch of them. We're doing our own science. But Menlo Systems, the German group that now is, you know, has a company is selling them, they'll sell you one for something like $750,000. Okay, so, or something like that. 
um, and it, let's say it, all, it operates well. And the, on the cost scale of building telescopes, that's like the water fountain budget or something. So you, should, you, you shouldn't have to worry about that cost. That will not be the limitation, the cost of the Asher combs. So it's a good point you're, you're making. Can you have a whole bunch of medium-sized telescopes rather than one ginormous telescope? Yeah, good question. But then you run into issues of how many places in the world can you put such telescopes? There aren't many really awesome places to put telescopes, but you could, let's say, take, instead of having one giant telescope on a mountaintop, why don't you put a bunch of them? So I wish maybe we have some telescope expert here who can tell me why they do less of that. I know that many of the big telescopes, the really big ones, are multiple mirror now, which is of the same spirit. It's now all multiple mirrors all together in one building rather than putting the mirrors in different buildings. But they're coherently linked, which is hard. I mean, here we incoherent. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Adam? Maybe one more question. We have a break. So we yeah. So Shimon uh, touched on this. There's the problem of the, uh, kind of the relative angle of your orbital plane to both the radial velocity and the kind of transit type uh, measurements. Are there, can you comment on how, how constricted that is and if there are any measurements which are less sensitive to that fact? <laughs> So yes, so the, right, so I obviously skated over that because I was trying to get the qualitative points up, across. So, so for the um, transit measurements, there's a few, I forget, forget the actual number, it might be 10 degree, 20, 20 degree angular range in which one can detect these transits. And there are some systematic errors associated with which part of the star, the, let's say if you're right on line to be passing here, but if, if, it's a, if it's like this, you're clipping more of the wing. So you have to account for that sort of thing. And I, since I don't do the transit, data reduction myself. I don't know exactly how well they do that, but there's, that, there's a systematic error associated with that. For the radial velocity measurements, you're, of course, really measuring the projection of that velocity, radial velocity vector along your line of sight. It's what they call K sine I, but whatever. So you're not really limiting the mass. You're limiting the mass times the sine of the angle of incidence from here down, right? And so, um, but when you have the transit and the radial velocity measurements at the same time, then you've determined that that line of sight is within this relatively modest range. More, attempting to be more complete and accurate plots won't put just, they won't plot mass, they'll plot this mass with like the sign of the angle of incidence and, and then have, or mass with various error bars that are errors associated with systematic uncertainty. So when they're being really serious about it, they account for these sorts of things. Now you're asking, you're basically implying you know almost everything I've said. The question is, is there some other technique that people use which is not as, not as susceptible to that? And there, there are additional, so I think they all are susceptible to this um, collection issue that you're not getting all the, the planets that are there probably, assuming that orbital axes of rotation are randomly distributed or isotropically distributed within the galaxy. I don't even know if that's really known. Maybe there are some overall galactic rotation effects which tend to bias it, but most of what I've heard is that there's enough mixing in the, in, inside the interstellar medium that they are pretty isotropically distributed. So people make estimates of how many planets are there and that sort of thing, typically accounting for a kind of iso assuming an isotropic distribution and saying we're only catching some fraction of them. Right? There are additional techniques which are used occasionally to detect planets that have to do with the way the planets um, affect at other aspects of the, of the star's spectrum other than just a center mass motion and other aspects of the light, given whether they're coming uh, at the intensity of light and, and, and effects that have to do with uh, a correlation between, as the planet is passing in front, this, it's like this blue shift, red shift aspect I said of passing on one side where it's blue shift and the other side where it's red shift. People can get information about planets that way too, so-called Rosser-McLaughlin effect. But it again assumes that you're detecting the information because you've got a, the planet is passing in front enough to be able to see it. So the basic answer is, uh, in almost all cases, except if you have direct imaging which and spectroscopy, you need the, you're limited to these planets which are close enough to the angle of sight. Now. What are the prospects for direct imaging and spectroscopy of the planets? Uh, at the beginning, I talked about how that's very hard because these planets are so close in an angular sense to their stars and all, the fraction limits your ability to see the small amount of light. How about interferometry? We talk about all these various techniques to remove for, foregrounds or unwanted big signals and see a small signal on top of it. Can one use some form of clever interferometry to screen out the light, not just a, a, you know, a little mask and look for light over here, but something a little smarter than that? 
it's particularly when you already know where the planet is and you know exactly where it is and its distance and things, but you just have this diffraction problem with a finite size telescope. And yes, people have proposals to do that that would work pretty well, it looks like, but the corrupting influence of the atmosphere, because it's, it's going to take fine-tuning the, of the interferometer to do such good canceling, makes it unlikely to work on the ground. So those proposals are to do things in space. And as you might have heard, when you do things in space, it takes money and takes a long time.